Um, so can I welcome everybody this afternoon to this um, education session on various aspects of ischemic heart disease and I'm delighted to um, welcome our speakers and so thank you very much to the speakers, Helper de Silva, Consultant Cardiologist at Dyson St Thomas's, Kate Gransmer and Claire Schnarr, um, Clinical Nurse Specialists um, in the Rat Pack Clinic at the PRU in Bromley and Helen Williams, Consultant um, pharmacist for South East London and Rachel Howardson, senior CVD pharmacist for South London, who are going to be covering the various sessions this afternoon. Um, we will be recording the session so that people can access it after the um, after the, after this afternoon. Um, so by um, but being part of the session, you are consenting to it being recorded. Can I ask that you please go on to mute and also have your video off if you're not speaking and we will take questions at the end of each speaker so each speaker will, will have about 15 minutes and then take questions and could you please put those into the chat. Uh, so without any further ado um, I'll pass over to Kalpa, thank you. Thanks Sally and can you hear me is my, oh yeah, yeah can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Just give me a second. But uh, in terms in terms of introduction, I'm, as Sally, I mentioned, I'm an interventional cardiologist at St Thomas's. I have an interest in coronary artery disease predominantly. And I've recently been involved with setting up a chest pain pathway. And that's particularly why this topic is um, pertinent to me and why I'm keen to try and convey my sort of interest in it and the importance of developing chest pain pathways more generally. Um, now, can you see my screen as a full screen? Not yet, no. Not yet. It's taking a bit of time. It should be there now, hopefully. No, not yet. Okay, hold on. I'm throwing the the timing off kilter straight away. Good work. Yeah, very good. Let's try again. There we go. Yeah, this might work. Yes, we can see that. There we go. So, um, so my job and title for the next 15 20 minutes is discussing investigation of chest pain, current practice and also introduce the group to the idea of chest pain pathways and how they have evolved and changed uh, over the last few years. So why is chest pain important? Going straight into it, it's relevant and important because it's very common uh, both in primary and secondary care. There are a number of possible diagnoses you know, from a non-cardiac perspective that we often need to rule out prior to thinking about coronary artery disease being the, the, the causative problem. I think it's important, particularly in, in Western society, to appreciate that there is an increased prevalence of diabetes and obesity, and, and therefore there's an increased concern and awareness of coronary artery disease, particularly in these populations. Why we should try and get things right is obviously for the patient first and foremost, but Sadly, it's important from our perspective that we need to investigate patients correctly and efficiently because we are in an environment where litigation is increasingly common. And from an investigation point of view, we have to think about chest pain investigation from a cost effectiveness point of view, ensuring it's efficient and the patient journey is efficient, but also that the appropriate test is being um, conducted for the appropriate patient. So I just want to start with a case that um, just sum summarises the types of patients that we get. 68, 67-year-old, hypertensive, hypercholesterolemic, diabetic, and has a six to eight month history of retrosternal pain, which is sometimes reproduced on exertion and relieved by rest. Sounds fairly typical of, of angina. ECG done by the, the GP shows sinus rhythm with no evidence of any underlying ischemia. So this was referred for rapid access chest pain review. I want to keep that in your mind's eye for the for the time being, but this is a sort of context or type of patient that we often see and deal with and you, you often see and deal with in primary care. So what tests would you perform? Now I'm just going to list these as a uh, in a group just to give you an idea of the types of investigations that we often commonly 
uh, used to investigate chest pain and treadmill, CT coriandrogram, ischemia testing such as uh, nuclear scintigraphy, stress echo or cardiac MRI or invasive coriandrography are the main modes of investigation. I would normally ask everyone in the audience to tell me what they'll think, but for the purposes of time and, and getting through this, I'm just going to move on. But that is what I'm going to really base my next few slides on in terms of the, the investigations we will uh, touch on. What is the aim of a chest pain pathway? I think from my perspective, it's to identify a, a patient who has potentially got coriander disease, investigate them to either diagnose or refute that diagnosis, and then implement lifestyle changes, initiate primary or secondary prevention and perform revascularization where it's indicated. And that dark blue box at the bottom is probably the smallest subset of patients. It's, it really is the minority of patients we end up seeing. And I thought what would be a good starting point was how we would define angina. And, you know, we often see patients who with a, a variety of descriptions, descriptors of, of chest pain, but angina specifically is chest pain, which is followed uh, after a period of exertion and relieved by rest. That's the sort of very broad uh, description. And then we can think about if it's typical, atypical or non-anginal chest pain. And typical angina, where we define it as a substernal chest discomfort, which is provoked by exertion or emotional stress and relieved by rest or sublingual GTM within a few minutes. Atypical angina is where we have two of these three characteristics and non-anginal chest pain is it lacks or meets only one of these characteristics. So I think that's important just to give um, the context of how we define angina going forward in, in when we review these types of patients. Something that we use certainly in secondary care a lot is the Canadian Cardiology Society class of angina and it's a very useful way of us sort of giving both a uh, patient a perspective of how much anginal burden they have, but also for us in terms of monitoring and keeping patients under surveillance. So class one, ordinary activity does not cause angina. And class four is essentially where you're in, unable to carry out any physical activity without chest discomfort and keeping with angina. And that class four is almost going on toward um, unstable angina. And you have class two and three, which is something in, in the middle. Now, risk assessment is less done in this in this sort of fashion. We don't really use pretest probabilities anymore, but this is a historic slide from the European Heart Journal, the ESC guidelines back in 2013. But I just want to give you an idea that patients, if we stick with the left side of the of this chart, typical angina, as we get older, you're, as you'd expect, more likely to develop angina. And those who are certainly over 70 years of old of age, their chance of if they've got typical symptoms of having significant coronary artery disease is very, very high. So I think that should guide what type of investigation you do, along with what other what tests you have available in your local uh, you know, hospital infrastructure. But it's important to think about the individual patient, their age, their other comorbidities to define their risk, even if it's broad and ballpark and not necessarily giving a, a percentage or figure, but it's important to bear that in mind. What's the definition of unstable angina and myocardial infarction? So chest pain on minimal exertion or at rest resulting in ischemic chest pain is what we would say is unstable angina. And a myocardial infarction is exactly the same, but associated with either ECG changes or more commonly troponin leak within the bloodstream when that's assayed. So this is the sort of schematic of the pathophysiology of coronary artery disease, looking on the bottom at the schema of a normal coronary artery on the left, all the way out to the right hand side where you have increasing atheroma burden. Eventually you have a plaque rupture, which is the third uh, artery from the right. And then um, potentially if you don't suffer an infarct at any stage, you may just have a very tight narrowing, which is the far right um, um, artery. And it is all one continuum. So you have stable angina on one side, and as people, as time goes on, that stable angina can progress into an unstable angina scenario, or more likely an acute coronary syndrome, which is where you have this increase in, uh, in atheroma burden, reduced luminal narrowing, 
so increased numeral narrowing with reduced ability to uh, have oxygen, appropriate oxygen demand to the heart, which leads to angina and maybe an ACS. And that's the same for strokes and also for peripheral vascular disease. This is a, a video which may hopefully play. No, it doesn't. Okay, we'll move on. Um, but that was showing the idea that atheroma burden and the idea of coronary artery disease is this continuum and stable angina and acute coronary syndromes are part of the same puzzle in many ways. So now going on to investigations, which test and when? My computer's just frozen for a second. There we go. So the, broadly, the way we can think about investigations for ischemic heart disease is either anatomical or uh, functional. So anatomical tests are things like CT scans or coronary angiograms, which, are, which is the invasive equivalent. Functional tests are looking for the, the surrogate of having a narrowed coronary artery, which is a reduction in blood flow or ischemia, which is either assessed by stress echo, cardiac MRI or nucleus integrity. Exercise testing is a functional test, but it's not very accurate. And so it's not something we use that often anymore. So ideally, you want to test that provides both anatomic and functional information. This is, again, a slightly dated slide, but it gives you a feel. Historically, we used to use different tests depending on the probability of the patient. We've, we've sort of moved away from this because partly because of what's available within the NHS and within our local hospital infrastructure. But again, it should give you an idea that those who have high, high probability of significant coronary artery disease, we should think about doing a more definitive investigation, such as an angiogram, if, if that's appropriate in, in the individual patient. So it should be tailored to the individual patient and their background. So functional testing looks at ischemia and the presence of ischemia. And the reason we think that's important, but perhaps not as important as we once did based on more recent data, is that those that had a large burden of ischemia who were treated with PCI versus or PCI or bypass surgery compared to medical therapy alone, historically in an observational setting seem to do better when they're characterised according to their ischemic burden. And this was an, another um, sort of graph showing that. You can see on the, on the y-axis the death rate going up as your ischemic burden goes up. There's been more randomised data suggesting that's not as definitive in the last year or two, but it's still pertinent in certain patients to search for ischemia rather than the presence of a narrowing per se. So historically and still within current practice, we, we do feel that an increased burden of ischemia relates directly to cardiac morbidity and mortality, though it's not as uh, defined as perhaps this slide suggests. And the threshold of 12.5% of your left ventricular mass and revascularizing, re if it's above that, is perhaps less true now, but still something for us to bear in mind when we're thinking about an individual patient. Now, investigations aren't all equal. This is the sensitivity and specificity across a number of tests. You can see it varies, you know, very markedly across all the tests. And I think the one thing I want to highlight is the exercise ECG. It's not a good test because the sensitivity is relatively low. And therefore, you know, what you want is to try and combine sensitivity specificity. So some tests identify the presence of coronary disease, such as CT, whilst others determine the significance, such as stress imaging. So if you have something that combines the two, that will really increase your ability to tell the patient what's going on. So these are, the, again, the broad gambit of tests that we look at. The first thing that many of you do is blood tests. And I just wanted to touch on this very busy slide showing that blood tests are really important because what we're needing to understand is this is a metabolic problem and a biologic issue that um, these investigations, all of the imaging investigations don't really inform us about, but things like glucose, cholesterol, anemia, the presence of evidence of anemia or thyroid uh, function is really important and something that we should be screening all of our patients prior to uh, referral. Troponins are a very useful test, but the one thing I wanted to touch on was that it's very helpful in patients with acute chest pain because it cleaves 
off myocytes during ischemic stress, but it isn't particularly specific and it can occur from a, in a number of different uh, uh, etiologies. And this is just a, a very sort of small list actually of other causes of troponin leak. And you can tell, you can see at the bottom, there are multifactorial reasons such as, you know, sepsis and being critically unwell or renal dysfunction, um, even strenuous exercise in some marathon runners have been shown to leak troponin. So it's it's not a specific test. So it needs to be done in the context of acute ischemic chest pain. So it's sensitive but not specific and can be elevated for a number of reasons. So the ECG is the next test, which we all know it's very helpful. It can tell us some basic information about different physiologic states such as the presence of ischemia, but it's generally performed at rest and therefore can be normal in patients with coronary artery disease. So it's not always hugely helpful. Excise testing is not a good investigation and I don't think should be performed in 2021. Um, it's a good test to look at patients' excise capacity in general, but isn't a good test of defining whether they have significant coronary artery disease. Echocardiography is an ultrasound-based uh, test, non-invasive, can assess both anatomy and function because you can do it at rest and during stress, which is the ischemia testing side of it. It can be portable, it's relatively cheap, and it is now widely used and adopted around the NHS, but it is operator dependent. So if you don't have the skill set within the department, the, the results you get may vary. This is just... Two minutes, please. Thank you. This is an image of an echo um, and shows you the kind of detail you can see. And this is an image of a valve assessment, which I'll just flick forward through. And this is a, a stress echo, which if plays will show the, the rest of the top left and the peak ischemic test at the bottom right. And it, it, what should show is that there's an area that's not working very well, which defines the region of uh, ischemia, which will then def will help us uh, decide what artery to treat. That video has uh, seemingly uh, halted my, there we go. So we've gone to nuclear testing, which is less commonly used, but a good perfusion test. Uh, but again, depends on infrastructure within hospital. I'm just going to flip forward and to just show you this as a, a slide to identify that the presence of calcium can really identify patients individual cardiovascular risk and you can see that very high resolution imaging that you can get with CT. On the right is a new research-based tool currently which is called CTFFR which can give you both anatomic but also functional information. So the area in red is defined in this algorithm as someone with a significant stenosis. However there is room for improvement with this technology, it's not yet widespread across the, the NHS. This is a cardiac MRI, which is very high resolution imaging, can do both um, anatomical and functional information with no radiation, but it is expensive and tends to be in only specialist centres. So it's less widely available. I'm just going to flick through these in, in the context of time. And coronary angiography is the final investigation, which is invasive. However, it's the most detailed test that we have and allows us to treat coronary arteries at the same time as assessing them. Um, so it has the advantage of being both diagnostic and therapeutic. In, in the appropriate patient, this is it still remains the gold standard. And many of you would have heard the term fractional flow reserve, which is an adjunctive physiologic assessment that we can do within the cath lab, um, which gives us not just the anatomy of the, the lesion within the angiogram, but also derives function information to tell us whether we need to treat that with either bypass or um, uh, stenting. And it's based on Ohm's law, which I won't bore you with now, but it gives you this type of physiologic data real time, which uh, allows us to guide our therapy. So we don't just use the angiographic severity anymore. It, we use these types of uh, adjunctive uh, assessment. So that's the investigation side of it. I'm just going to conclude final slide if I can get to it, Sally Ann. Just um, I'm going to skip the case, but I just want to just touch on the pathway because I think it's important for the audience just to understand what the pathway involves. Um, but just my slides are being particularly slow, unfortunately. 
think we're moving now. Okay. So this is our case from the beginning. And one of the reasons the chest pain pathways are important is the next slide will highlight what happens to many of our patients. Um, and this is tends to, this tends to be the journey. They tend to have a number of investigations rather than perhaps one or two, which is of both costly, time inefficient, and not great from a patient perspective. So the idea of pathways is really important. Important. This is something I've been involved with recently um, at St Thomas's, uh, guys at St Thomas's as a trust. And the next slide, I think, is really the the key one that I wanted to leave people with. If it ever gets to it. Apologies, my computer's having a, a bad day at the office. Here we go. So this inclusion exclusion, I think, is really key. The idea is it should be for as many patients as possible who we think have got anginas. This is a chest pain pathway, not for breathlessness or any other arrhythmia, specifically for who we think have got coronary artery disease. Um, and then the final slide I wanted to finish on is the exclusions, which I think it's important to point out that this isn't, um, you know, a, a one stop shop for any patient you think may have a cardiac problem, but it's one for those who have, you know, what we think is angina. So this is not for breathlessness palpitations. This is who you think may have angina. And they're the patients we really want to focus on and try and send to this type of uh, specific disease specific clinic. Thank you very much. I'll stop there in view of time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kalpa. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat. So has anyone got a burning question they would like to ask Kalpa before we move on to the next speaker? If you'd like to raise your hand. There's a bit of a whistle stop to author, apologies. OK, so no one's raised up. Oh, so can you cover low medium risk criteria for the pathway? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that's the, the, the low medium risk of patients who, who you think have what we've described as stable angina hasn't progressed uh, rapidly. So they're not it's not gone from CCS class one to CCS class four in a short space of time, but also their underlying comorbidities are also um, low risk, so they may just be hypertensive and relatively young, rather than, for example, a 75-year-old diabetic who's had re revascularization in the past with a recurrence of angina. That patient is a high-risk patient or at least intermediate risk who should just be referred back to the cardiologist that has treated them in the past, not to a more generic rapid access clinic. Thank you. And um, can you explain the role of col colchicine in coronary oh, artery disease? Yeah, interesting question. Um, so colchicine, as most of you know, has been used in gout for years. It's been used in pericardial inflammation for a long time because it reduces uh, inflammation generally. Colchicine is, is beginning to be seen within the sphere of coronary artery disease as it's an anti from an anti-inflammatory point of view. We don't use it routinely yet because the data is relatively early, but it looks like them, there, there is good data to suggest that it can pacify coronary disease a bit like statins can do, and then can therefore reduce the risk of acute coronary syndromes in patients who have established, diagnosed coronary artery disease. So this is when we've diagnosed it and we're really being nuanced about their treatment, not upfront. Someone has angina, we put something, someone on culture scene. It's really downstream when they've been seeing someone in, in, in hospital and, and define risk. Thank you. So there is another question, but I think this might be answered in the next session. So I'm going to move on. So thank you very much, Kalpa. Thank you. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, and I'd like to hand over to Kate and Claire, please. Hello, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to share my screen. Yes, we can see that. That's lovely, thank you. Okay, so my name's Claire and I'm here with my colleague Kate and we're the clinical nurse specialists at the Princess Royal University Hospital, part of the King's College NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and we're going to talk today about referrals into the rapid access chest pain clinic. So rapid access chest pain clinics were introduced by the National Service Framework in 2000 
and our practice is guided by the NICE guidance for recent onset of chest pain of suspected cardiac origin, which was updated in 2016, and also by the ESC guidance on chronic coronary syndromes 2019. Rapid access chest pain clinics are for patients with suspected recent onset stable angina only, so they're not for patients with rest symptoms suggested of acute coronary syndrome. It's a two week wait clinic in order to provide rapid diagnosis and cardiac specialist care. As there are limited slots, it's essential to capture those patients who are likely to have stable angina and would benefit prognostically from early assessment, diagnosis and treatment. So there is a South London rapid access chest pain clinic referral pathway, which is probably slightly different from the one we saw before for Guy's and St Thomas's. Um, and it's been developed based on the features of stable angina. So just to recap, these being retrosternal discomfort of a few minutes duration, provoked by physical effort and or acute emotional stress and relieved within minutes by rest or GTA. So patients who would meet the referral criteria are males aged 30 or over, females <coughs> aged 40 or over, and with two to three features of stable angina. So if you have patients with known coronary artery disease, um, they should be referred back to the trust in which most of their cardiac care was previously undertaken if possible. So that just ensures continuity of the care. Inappropriate referrals would be patients with only zero or one features or males less than 30 years old, females less than 40 year olds. Patients who don't meet the rapid access referral criteria, but their chest pain may be cardiac, please um, use advice and guidance or consultant to connect to discuss with the cardiologists. They may still be seen in rapid access if the cardiologist thinks that this is appropriate. So we did also get asked about shortness of breath on exertion. So shortness of breath on exertion without chest pain with the two to three features of angina would be an inappropriate referral for the rapid access chest pain clinic. For those who present with shortness of breath, please initially consider non-cardiac causes. If there's evidence of heart failure, please consider referral to the heart failure clinic as per their criteria. If alternative causes for the shortness of breath have been excluded, but the shortness of breath as an angina equivalent needs to be investigated, please consider using advice and guidance or consultant connect. Again, the patient may still be seen in the rapid access chest pain clinic if the reviewing consultant thinks that this is appropriate. For those with rest pain, then with rest chest pain that is an ACS, please send them to A&E. If it's not clear whether it's an ACS, you can consider contacting the cardiologists via the hospital switchboard to discuss. Otherwise, please consider other causes for the chest discomfort. And again, if it's felt that a cardiac diagnosis still needs to be excluded, please use advice, guidance or consultant connect. OK, thanks very much, Claire. My name is Kate and um, as Claire said, we work together in the Rapid Access Chest Pain Clinic at PRU. So this next slide is really just um, highlighting um, for you to consider the referral requirements to, our, to, to the services. Um, most services will have a local referral form and we'll come on to that a bit later on. So we'd ask you to kindly consider, consider sending the following information. So thinking about your patient's risk factors, um, this might seem obvious, but it gets you to think about, you know, their lipids and their blood pressure. Are these two factors controlled as well as, of course, smoking and um, first degree relative um, with heart disease who's 60 or under? Um, could you also think about considering um, their physical examination before referring them on? So baseline heart rate, um, blood pressure, murmurs, evidence of heart failure. Sounds quite obvious, but it can give a lot of information about um, is this the right service for you to refer the patient into, particularly if their heart rate's irregular and then you do a 12 lead ECG to rule out atrial fibrillation, etc. Um, murmurs again just to rule out cardiac murmurs and evidence of aortic stenosis again just highlighting is rapid access the right service for these patients 
Uh, and as Claire's already mentioned, um, evidence of heart failure, again, but should that patient be referred into the heart failure clinic rather than rapid access chest pain clinic? 12 lead ECGs as a baseline um, are, are really useful, um, particularly if the patient's going to be seen in a, a telephone rapid access chest pain clinic, which was the case when COVID was at its um, height. Uh, also, thinking about bloods, again, this has been mentioned earlier, um, but you know, knowing what your patient's HB is before you refer them in to us, um, also looking at lipids, etc., to make sure they're controlled. And if you're thinking about a tro troponin, um, please send them to A&E. Troponins are not required for rapid access chest pain clinic, and these patients should be going to A&E. Uh, the last point is just really um, signposting all the obvious health advice to your patients so that we're all building on the same message really. So, um, you know, mental health service, our, our local one is, um, uh, you know, the NHS IAP program, so access to psychological therapy, smoking cessation, diet and exercise. Looking at the next slide, um, again, it's just getting you to think about if, if you're referring a patient into rapid access and you're, and, you're want, and you're thinking that they've got stable angina, then could you please consider prescribing pro prognostic medication? So these are medications that will improve your patient's outcome. So um, again, a lot of this is obvious, your aspirin 75, statin 40, your bisoprolol, um, GTN spray as required. And again, thinking about um, any antihypertensive medications that might be required, because again, if the patients are coming to the clinics and their blood pressures are not controlled, it can exclude them from some of the tests that we might be using, such as dibutamine stress echo. This um, slide is again it's sorry it's a slightly busy slide but it's just trying to give you an example of local referral forms so this is the one that we use um, at PRU um, and again just reiterating some of what's already said which is getting you to think about the inclusion and exclusion criteria so the services for exertional chest pain uh, men over, over 30 women over 40 if you have a younger person that you're suspecting may have exertional chest pain, then these patients really should be discussed with the cardiologist via um, cardiology advice and guidance. And I think in some other areas it's called Consult and Connect. Um, as already mentioned, patients with prolonged chest pain at rest should go to A&E, not to rapid access chest pain clinic. If they're under active follow up by a cardi cardiologist, then please refer them back to that cardiologist. And if they have a complicated cardiac history, just bearing in mind that this service is, is a nurse-led service, so you know, would this patient be better served by seeing a cardiologist? And again, thinking about patients with palpitations, abnormal ECGs without chest pain, isolated rest pain or pain without an exertional cause, um, referring them on to uh, the appropriate alternative services. So it's um, thinking about things like if your patients have got palpitations, dizziness, syncope, um, have you done a 12 lead ECG? Would this patient be better served in the arrhythmia clinic? Um, if the patient has a cardiac murmur, have you have you referred them to open access echo? Again, would they be better served in the valve clinic? As mentioned already, um, if there's evidence of heart failure and you know, raised BMP, should these patients be referred? to the heart failure clinic uh, and again considering uh, general cardiology as well. So really just to summarise, um, it's patients, males over 30s, females over 40s that have two to three features of angina. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions? Yeah. Thank you so much Claire and Kate, really clear. Um, there are some questions coming through. Um, so the, the one that was left over from last time, which I don't know whether you can answer, but perhaps Kalpa could 
um, chip in as well if necessary. Should the chest pain pathway also include non-obstructive causes of, of angina, e.g. microvascular angina, vasoplastic angina, etc. Not uncommon, but under-recognised causes of angina. Maybe Cowper <laughs> might want to answer that one. Oh, may I answer that? Uh, oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Barla. Would you like to answer that? Yeah. Uh, we are, the clinic is basically for patients who you think may have angina. Until we have investigated them further, we would not know whether they have a disease or microvascular angina. So if they have already been investigated previously, and had a diagnosis of microvascular angina, they should go to cardiology clinic rather than um, the nurse-led um, rapid access clinic. As we, as Kate and Claire clearly said, this is for investigation of new onset chest pain, which might be due to angina. It is not for any coronary artery disease. Please remember that this is a nurse-led clinic and uh, their limit is very uh, defined and very strictly guided. Would that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, Claire and um, Kate, just to let you know that you're still sharing your screen and we can see your emails. Uh, so moving on to the next question, is there a defined pathway at Kings or Prue for those already diagnosed with coronary artery disease have deteriorating symptoms that require rapid assessment but not severe enough yet for A&E? Pre-COVID and urgent cardiology referral was still in the order of a few months. I think that's me again. Dr. <laughs> this is Dr. Bala. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but you uh, Yeah, no, no, you answered Dr. Bala. No, about you and Kings, so I thought I would answer that. Yeah. If, if the patient is known coronary artery disease, uh, it is best that you refer the patient back to the original cardiologist. But uh, we do uh, prioritize patients with known coronary artery disease, especially if they have had any intervention in the past year or so. Uh, because these patients, we are very much concerned about stem thrombosis and other complications from intervention. So they, they would be prioritized and we may sometimes directly contact the patient even without offering an appointment and bring them into ambulatory or emergency department. Um, sometimes we well, book, overbook them in our clinics. But again, as I said, these are complex patients and they should not be sent to a nurse-led clinic. Uh, we, if we feel that these are, say, moderate or low-risk patients, we may sometimes uh, divert these patients to the rapid access clinic um, with a, a, a speedy evaluation. But if the patient is waiting for a long time it is, and you are concerned about it, it's best to contact the uh, consultant who have treated the patient previously, either via advice and guidance or even directly via email, because we do um, take very uh, quick decisions about these patients. I was just going to add, Dr. Bala, if I may, that I totally agree with what you said and, and reiterate that if you, from a patient perspective, there are, there are two important points. One is continuity of care. I think if a patient's been involved with a consultant who's done their procedure, either it be bypass or a PCI, really for the patient, it's better for them to see that the consultant. But also, more importantly, there needs to be a feedback mechanism um, if there are ongoing symptoms for that patient to be able to be seen directly in that individual consultant's clinic. And I think I have to be honest, I'm as a user advice and guidance uh, from the sort of tertiary centre end, I'm not a huge fan of it for these types of patients because advice and guidance is a generic tool that goes to all cardiologists. And so you end up having someone with a complex coronary history being reviewed by, you know, perhaps a colleague who's a specialty in EP or heart failure. And, and, and that's not necessarily the right thing for the patient. So I think if they've got a history and you have a point of care in terms of a consultant that you know, my, my preference personally, and I think within our interventional group across King's and St Thomas's is to as Dr. Barr said, try and highlight that to the consultant involved. 
Thank you very much. There's one last question, which Kelper, perhaps you could answer it very quickly before we move on to the next speaker. I mean, it follows on from what you've just been saying. Could you clarify the difference between the GSTT chest pain pathway versus the pathway that um, Claire and Kate have just spoken to, yeah, yeah. as they are both pathways for stable angina? Yeah, so, yeah, so good, good question. Um, the, the reality is each trust, unfortunately, develops and organises their own pathways due to uh, various things, looking at uh, staff availability, the infrastructure of different tests that we have available to us, and therefore they are much the same in principle, but there are subtle differences. So I think the premise that uh, Kate and Claire mentioned about these patients being for stable angina holds true across the board. And we are trying to uh, organise a more broad South London uh, chest pain pathway. So don't feel that there are major differences. There are some differences, but not majorly. And therefore, I think if you have a patient that has stable angina, or you feel may have stable angina, generally speaking, wherever you refer to, if it's the appropriate patient, they will get seen in that in that uh, rapid access service. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, Kate and Claire. Excellent, really clear presentation. And can I now pass over, please, to Helen and Rachel? Thanks, Ali -Ann. I'm going to start and then hand over to Rachel. Can you put them on? Yeah, full screen. Thanks, Rachel. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the management of patients with ischemic heart disease and we're going to start with a case. Next slide please. So this man is actually at the other end of the, ex of the spectrum that we've talked about today. He's a white British male aged 56 and discharged from hospital, hospital following a non-STEMI and he's had coronary intervention with a drug eluting stent to the left main stem. His ejection fraction is 60% so he doesn't have any uh, left ventricular dysfunction. He's not on any, he wasn't on any medicines before he went to hospital and he's been discharged with aspirin 75 milligram daily, ticagrelor 90 milligram twice daily, ramipril 1.25 milligram twice daily, bisoprol 2.5 milligram daily, atorvastatin 80, omeprazole and a GTN spray and his blood pressure at discharge was 115 over 78. So these are the sorts of patients you may see having had an acute admission with uh, with an acute coronary syndrome coming back into general practice. So what do we need to do next in primary care? Next slide, please. So we've heard already that coronary disease is a spectrum, a spectrum that starts with stable angina, it would uh, be on the far left of this slide, and then there's a spectrum within the acute coronary syndromes. Most commonly, we, we know about ST elevation MI, that's the classic heart attack, with full thickness damage to the myocardial, uh, to the myocardium, and then non-ST elevation MI. We started to recognise this much more over the past couple of decades with the uh, advent of the um, troponin testing, which picks up much more subtle damage to the myocardium, um, and you don't see necessarily those classic ST segment changes on the ECG. And then probably a, a smaller cohort now of unstable angina, as the troponin tests have become more uh, sensitive, we're picking up more and more people that were able to put into that non-ST elevation MI cohort. But there is a group where the symptoms are unstable. The troponin may not be raised uh, and the ECG doesn't show classic signs and they would be considered to have unstable angina. Next slide, please. So we have guidance from NICE around how we should manage these patients after having an acute event. And one important element is cardiac rehabilitation. And uh, the other element is around secondary prevention, both lifestyle to uh, reduce risk and drug therapy uh, for secondary prevention. So we're just going to go through some of the key interventions uh, and talk a little bit about the evidence for them. Next slide, please. So first of all, we need to think about lifestyle factors and our patient David smokes 20 cigarettes a day. He travels a lot with work, so he eats out a lot. And I'd be thinking, well, what about his salt intake? What about his saturated fat intake? Like most of us, he doesn't really exercise much because he doesn't have time. We might think about it, but we often don't get around to doing it. He is a little overweight with a BMI of 27.8 and he drinks four to five units most evenings and more at weekends. So we're all thinking of all the interventions we'd like to make now to adjust his lifestyle, but clearly we've got to do that in 
combination with the patient, in fact, encourage them to set some goals around lifestyle change, try and motivate them to want to change and, uh, and give them some encouragement. And then maybe support services we can refer them to, depending on what he wants to, uh, to focus on. We might want him to focus on smoking cessation, but that might not be his priority. And, and until he's ready to stop smoking, we might need to focus on other things with him. And we have to be realistic. It's unlikely he's going to change everything at once. But let's start small and, and work our way up. The other thing we can do to support lifestyle change, of course, is encourage his attendance at cardiac rehab. Uh, patients who are recommended rehab by cardiologists specifically, but by other clinicians as well, are much more likely to attend. And, and at the moment, um, around half of patients do attend rehabilitation uh, nationally, which means, of course, 50 percent aren't getting the benefits of cardiac rehab. And we need to do more for them in primary care. Next slide, please. So in terms of drug therapy, we have a number of aims. One is to try to prevent clot formation in the coronaries so that we don't get a repeat event, reduce the workload of the heart and improve blood supply. So we know we're going to limit episodes of ischemia going forward, obviously prevent further events and manage the patient's symptom and, and improve their, their quality of life as much as possible. Alongside the second prevention, we also need to think of blood pressure management if they need diabetes, uh, blood sugar control, um, all of that needs to be looked at alongside. So if the patient has had an acute MI, so ST elevation MI or non-ST ele elevation MI, they should get the following drugs. Aspirin plus an additional antiplatelet therapy. You may be most familiar with clopidogrel because it's been around longer, but we also sometimes see prazogrel or ticagrelor. So that combination should be for at least 12 months. ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker for at least 12 months, and a high dose of a high intensity statin, such as a torvastatin 80 milligram. Next slide, please. The antiplatelet therapies really have changed uh, outcomes for patients who've had acute coronary events. We've seen a, a substantial reduction in the event rate over the past um, 10 or 15 years as we've gone from, well, we've been using aspirin for many decades, but we've gone from nothing to aspirin, to aspirin and clopidogrel, and most recently to aspirin plus prazogrel or ticagrelor. Each of those uh, steps reduces cardiovascular death MI or stroke, but the payoff, of course, is a small but significant increase in the risk of bleeding. Next slide, please. So after an acute coronary event, non-STEMI or uh, ST elevation MI, you should normally see aspirin 75 and prazogrel, a 60 milligram initially, then 10 milligram daily for a year, if the patient has had an acute coronary syndrome with some form of pu percutaneous coronary intervention. Now, NICE actually prefers this combination in ST, eleva ST elevation MI, but that's not necessarily um, what is happening in our locality. The other option for those patients is aspirin plus ticagrelor, 180 milligram loading, then 90 milligram twice daily for a year. And this is for patients with or without coronary intervention. So ACS with intervention, so, for example, a non-STEMI like our patient, or if they're for medical management, both non-STEMI uh, non and uh, STEMI patients. And some centres just prefer to use ticagrelor across all of these indications because it, it, uh, it's simpler to use one drug rather than to have to separate the cohorts uh, for prazogrel and ticagrelor. And then finally, there's aspirin plus clopidogrel. In this context, only really used now if patients have higher bleeding risk and therefore aren't suitable for the more potent agents. Next slide, please. So then we have the problem as to what happens at a year. These patients will be in primary care. They'll have had their years of dual antiplatelet therapy. And there are three options at this point. One is that we stop the more potent agent, clopidogrel, prasogrel, or ticagrelor, and just continue aspirin 75 milligram daily indefinitely. The second is that we switch to lower dose ticagrelor, 60 milligram twice daily, plus aspirin, and continue that for a further three years. Um, we could do that if they meet what we call the drama criteria. Next slide, please. So the drama criteria, as recommended by NICE, 
are for patients who've had an MI who have other high risk features. So they either have diabetes, chronic renal dysfunction with a creatinine clearance less than 60 mils a minute, aged over 65, angiographic evidence of multivessel, multivessel coronary disease or having had a second prior spontaneous MI. So you can probably just about make out the drama within that. Um, so that's one option and it's recommended by NICE. And the, thir the third option is to think about switching to rivaroxaban, two and a half milligram twice daily plus aspirin. And um, this is in line with NICE and, and a study called COMPASS. So these are patients who are at high, who have stable coronary artery disease, but are at high risk of future events or who have symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. And the criteria for high risk here is age 65 or over, or atherosclerosis in two different vascular beds, so coronary cerebrovascular or peripheral arterial disease, or two or more of the following risk factors. So smoking, diabetes, chronic kidney dysfunction, heart failure, on previous non-lacuna ischemic stroke. And obviously we have to think about the person's bleeding risk before considering rivaroxaban. And it is a tiny dose of rivaroxaban, two and a half milligram twice daily with aspirin, not to be confused with apixaban. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna hand over to Rachel now, who's going to take you through the other medicines for second prevention. Thanks, Helen. So um, the other medicines that will be prescribed in this, in this situation are beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So, and statins. Oh, now I've lost my slides. Can you still see them? Yeah, we can see them. You probably need to go to your PowerPoint icon at the bottom. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Right. Um, so ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors improve patient outcome post ACS in patients with and without heart failure. Um, and we have a lot of data for their use, um, especially the agents such as Ramapril and Perindapril. We can titrate the dose. Um, so um, when Ramapril started, it started at a low dose. And in, in primary care, it's important that we try and increase the dose um, as regularly as we can to a maximum tolerated or target dose. So for Ramapril in this patient, it would be five milligrams twice a day. Um, Hopefully we can complete this dose titration within four to six weeks of discharge, but it may take longer because every time you increase the dose, you need to check renal function and blood pressure. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what I just said. <laughs> and some electrolytes as well, because the potassium levels can go up. Some of the adverse effects that patients complain about, um, some patients do get symptomatic hypotension um, and some patients complain of a dry cough. In patients who have an, a dry cough that's not tolerated, we can swap the ACE inhibitor to an ARB, such as um, um, candesartan. So beta blockers as well, they also reduce mortality um, in patients who've had um, an ACS. Um, they control the heart rate, improve the blood supply, and reduce the cardiac workload and reduce the oxygen requirements. Um, they also help with patients who are having angina episodes. Again, we need to try and increase the dose if we can to a maximum tolerated dose. So for this patient on bisoprolol, we're, we're aiming for bisoprolol 10 milligrams daily. But we also need to keep an eye on the blood pressure and the heart rate. In um, the ACS um, guidance um, now, it's saying to continue beta blockers for at least 12 months um, and then review. But if a patient has any lymphoventricular dysfunction, then we should be um, trying to continue it if we can. The side effects of beta blockers are many, um, but some of the main ones are hypertension, bradycardia, and patients can feel quite tired, especially in the initial stages of titration. We also have um, some guidance now um, for lipid management, and this national guidance that you can find um, is endorsed by NICE, um, and it's been um, it's a collaboration between um, the AAC and NHS England. It's separated into primary prevention and secondary prevention. So for primary prevention, we're recommending atorvastatin 20 milligrams a day and secondary prevention is atorvastatin 80 milligrams a day. And then keeping an eye on the cholesterol and trying to get um, to targets of 40% lower than the baseline um, at, at the episode of the ACS. It's recommended that we keep an eye on the patients every three months just to try and make sure that we are treating them to this target if we can. There are also guidance um, from the um, UCL partners um, on lipid management that are available on the internet. Um, and these go into each um, of those phases in detail. Um, and so if, if someone's not achieving target on a tool with satin 80, we can also think about adding in isetamibe if we're still not um, managing to control cholesterol. 
There's also rosuvastatin that we can use. Um, the dose for this is generally 20 milligrams if you want to use a high intensity, high dose statin. Rachel, two minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, so the, also, the other thing that the NICE, um, the guidance has, is a table showing um, the cholesterol lowering ability of all the statins that we have. And as you can see, we're trying to use the high intensity statins. So the blue boxes are showing the statins that will reduce your cholesterol to the 40% and above target that we're aiming for. So we're looking for a torvastatin doses over 20 milligrams, vesuvastatin, um, and also adding in ezetimibe if we're still not achieving targets. So the issues we have with statins are that we are still prescribing low doses and we're still prescribing statins that are of moderate, moderate intensity. We still see patients taking pravastatin and simvastatin. Um, a lot of patients don't want to take statins, so you'll give them a prescription, but they won't actually Fill the prescription. Um, there are lots. There's lots of reports in the media um, about statin side effects that may be um, affecting patients' um, willingness to take therapy. There are also true intolerances to statin. So some patients do have a true um, intolerance to muscular aches and pains. Um, but actually, what we can do with these patients is reduce the dose and try different agents. It's not a, an absolute contraindication in all cases. Um, and what we can also do is support the patient adherence to statins and try and encourage them to continue with their therapy um, at every review um, because they may stay, take them very well initially, but generally the compliance just does go off over, over time. So this patient will be taking many, um, many medicines, um, aspirin 75 milligrams indefinitely, ticagrelor 90 milligrams twice a day for one year, and then it will be reviewed and it if the patient is high risk for a further cardiovascular event, the dose might be reduced to 60 milligrams twice a day. The ramipril dose needs up titrating if we can. The bisoprolol dose needs up titrating if we can. And also reviewing at one year. Um, if it's decided at one year to stop bisoprolol, we need to be really careful when we're stopping beta blockers because you can cause a reflex um, tachycardia and also um, exacerbate chest pain. So we have to be very careful and reduce the dose gradually. And the patient will be taking a statin at all of a statin 80 milligrams once a day. Some patients um, will need protection um, from the gastro, um, gastric um, side effects with the dual antiplatelet therapy. So to reduce the risk of bleeding, we, we do prescribe PPIs in some patients. And a patient will have a GTM spray in case of any episodes of angina. So in, in summary, multiple therapies are required to optimise outcomes in cardiovascular disease. Therapy should be used to manage both the symptoms and the patient's risk of having a further event. But patients do need to understand why they need multiple therapies um, and multiple prescription charges. Um, and the regimens should be tailored if we can to the individual and, and try and suit their lifestyle. And if you know, come across any adverse effects or the patient talks about any, we should deal with them as quickly as we can to encourage adherence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen and Rachel. Really interesting um, and comprehensive coverage of, of secondary prevention and, and treatment. Um, I'm mindful of the time. We've got a minute left and there were a couple of questions which have been answered in the chat. Um, so can I pass over to Dr. Bala just to um, bring the session to a close? Thank you very much. Uh, um, thanks for arranging this excellent session. Uh, Sally Ann and Andrea. I uh, hope everybody found it useful. It's a brief overview of uh, the relevant points uh, regarding chest pain pathway. Uh, please remember that rapid access chest pain clinic is a new onset chest pain, very suspect angina, especially coronary atherosclerotic angina only, and not for any chest pain. You may refer some patients, uh, you may be referring some patients who have high cardiac risk where you the pain is clearly non-anginal. These are what I would call a worried well patients and this is not the clinic for these worried well patients. They need reassurance, they need primary prevention which you are all very much familiar with that is controlling the diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia according to Family prevention guidelines, smoking cessation, lifestyle changes, etc. If you are still worried that uh, this patient is not uh, being reassured, you can use uh, uh, refer the patient to the cardiologist, which would give a 
more uh, a, a definitive uh, answer to their questions. Uh, we also find that patients with dyspnea are frequently referred to this uh, clinic, rapid access clinic. But um, as uh, both Dr. Kalpa and uh, Dr. Uh, Claire and Kate highlighted, this, this is not an um, appropriate service for that. Uh, we agree that occasionally patients, especially diabetics, may present with dyspnea, which may be their uh, angina equivalent. In fact, I would discourage you from asking the question, do you have chest pain, uh, but substitute it with chest discomfort, which would encompass most of the patients with angina. Some of them describe the discomfort as breathlessness, which is which would come out more appropriately if you ask the right question. So if it is dyspnea on exertion, first of all, rule out other causes of dyspnea. If you are worried, this would be due to cardiac cause, which are probably and we are to heart failure. If you are still worried and not sure, you can use the advice and guidance in these patients. Uh, please, importantly, historically we used to do exercise treadmill tests. We stopped doing that, as Dr. Indrizel was showed. It has very poor sensitivity in picking up patients with coronary artery disease. So please do not advise the patient that you would be getting an exercise test, treadmill test in the clinic, or even that you would be getting a coronary angiogram down the line. We know that many patients do not need a coronary angiogram. Uh, what prevents a heart attacks is medical management, as we have seen from orbital study. Only when there is a critical narrowing of a, a significantly low obstructive lesion or an un unstable block, then an angiography and the intervention is going to help. And we have the data from Orbita to support this. Increasingly, you'll see that uh, we would be sending uh, patients for cardiac CT. This probably picks up patients with non-obstructive coronary disease, even in patients with non-anginal chest pain. Non-anginal chest pain should not come to this clinic at all. But if they do uh, come up and if they have high risk, sometimes we advise the CT. And we do uh, pick up uh, coronary artery disease in these patients. These are these patients do not have angina. They still have non-angina chest pain, but they have early coronary artery disease. This is our chance to intervene aggressively with secondary prevention. So thank you, Helen and Rachel, for talking about secondary prevention. Uh, we have the medications that uh, uh, Ray, uh, Helen spoke to you about are mostly after MI, but patients who have non-obstructive coronary artery disease or any vascular disease for that matter require secondary prevention as opposed to the post-MI medications that Helen Williams has been talking about. Secondary prevention largely consists of antiplatelet, single antiplatelet, usually aspirin, and uh, Statins. The, many people ask uh, how long should the statins be given. The secondary prevention um, statins are given irrespective of the level of cholesterol. So please do not stop when the cholesterol is normal because we already know that the patient has atherosclerotic heart disease. Um, do we, what is the evidence for this? Well, we have the Scott Heart Study where patients with non anginal chest pain who were found to have non-obstructive coronary artery disease had second uh, less uh, events in the follow-up. So it is worth treating with um, secondary prevention in patients with non-anginal chest pain but have evidence of coronary artery disease. So recent uh, South London database uh, uh, analysis has shown that nearly a third of the patients that come to the rapid access chest pain clinic are present with non angina chest pain. Please remember that these are probably the ones who you know, are at high risk but do not have angina. These should not be coming to this clinic. These should go to cardiology clinic or just advice and guidance. Uh, why? What is the harm in that? It's just that the, the patients who benefit most or who are at a higher risk of coronary artery disease and even ACS may be waiting longer and may end up with some events. That is why we've got three 
uh, emphasizing the criteria for appropriate results to the rapid access clinic. And thank you all the speakers and the organizers for arranging this. I can answer a couple of questions quickly if we have the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this this um, recording will be circulated to everybody and we will be sending out certificates for um, CPD in the next few days. So thank you all very much to the speakers and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Uh, Helen and Rachel, are we OK just to stay on for five minutes? Uh, yeah, I think Helen may have left, but um, oh. I can help. Um, OK, thank me. I don't know if Calper's still with us or is he if he's trying to trying to leave. <laughs> Do you want to stop recording, Sally? I have. Yes, that good, 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 good idea. <laughs> do you think we ought to come out? Shall I just? Shall I? Actually, it's not easy just to to do a Zoom, is it? Uh, I, I call you on Microsoft Teams. Okay. If you if that will, will that will that work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Speak to you in a minute. Okay. okay. Bye. Yeah.